Ere Town Hall. Hi, and welcome to the Revolution Aero Town Hall. This week, very kindly sponsored by A Cubed by Airbus, the Airbus Innovation Centre. Uh, this week, we're going to be looking at um, which will come first autonomy in the air or autonomy in the sky. We've got four fantastic experts. I'm going to hand straight over to Kirsten Bartok. Kirsten's co-founder and one of the managing partners of Air Finance, AF Capital and New Vista Acquisition Corp. Uh, she's been in the aviation industry for a long time. Before that, she was in venture capital and banking. Kirsten, how are you? I'm doing well, Al. How are you? Very well. Great to see you. Um, nice to be let's, here. Let's talk about autonomy. As an investor in this sector, and you've been an investor in sector for quite a while, um, even before your SPAC, um, what do you think about autonomy? I think we think of it as, as a natural progression, but everyone has to understand that just as in the auto industry where you've got uh, you know, the five stages of autonomy, we have a similar, less defined route in aerospace. In fact, we, I always encourage people to look at autonomy as a step function is just like pilot assist. So if you come off here and you remove steps and what, um, requirements and, and jobs of the pilot, then that is making the pilot's life easier. And we've been doing that for a long time with avionics and improvements in that area. And then autonomy is really coming from the other side that covers the whole broad spectrum of it. So I, I always encourage people to look at it as a step function. It will come. It will be there eventually. We're starting with removing tasks from the pilots. And we're also working on uh, remotely piloted vehicles that will still uh, still require things. But until we figure out a way to, to manage the voice communications with ADSB, you know, there's a full different world that's going on between piloted aircraft that rely on communication between towers and drones that will not fly in airspace that are defined or controlled by, by towers and airports. So again, it, it's, not, uh, it's not binary. It's not here or there. It's a gradual progression. When you're looking at projects um, for VTOL or um, heavy cargo or even defense ones, which rely on total autonomy to, to work, is that, a, is that a barrier to you investing in them? Uh, is it a barrier that they're looking at autonomy or they're working on autonomy or is it, is it, is it do you worry that if, if, if someone's coming to you, say, with a VTOL that requires, uh, you know, wouldn't work if it was piloted with someone on board? Good. Does okay. that put you off? No, um, I think you have to understand that this is a long time horizon. Everyone talks about autonomy or VTOLs or drones delivery to be there in one, two, three years. We can't look at it like that. It's a progression and a step function. So I think about the next 20 years and when autonomy is really going to come in. We're obviously going to see it earlier on the drone side. Those, whether they're remotely piloted or making decisions through sense and avoid, which again are two different things. One, there's the concept of remotely piloting the vehicle. And then two, it's how many sensors and AI and machine learning do we have on the vehicle, which can allow it to make decisions on their own. And, and they're both, again, two very different things. So I think how we look at it is that you're going to see this autonomy function sooner rather sooner in in the UAV function, the non-passenger vehicles. But we are going to continue to see the progression of, of task removal and pilot assist and remotely piloted on the aircraft side as well, what was formerly piloted with a, with a, um, a pilot in place. So you just have to kind of adjust the lens in which you're looking at these two, two areas from a different approach, whether you have for drones and, and part 107 or, or, you know, part 23 to real, you know, passenger aircraft. At the moment, we're seeing a huge amount of uh, investor interest into mobility. Um, Archer, Joby, Lucid, that's just, you know, the last few weeks. Um, do you see investors moving on to companies focusing on single issues like autonomy or AI? Um, do you see interest there, you know, selling the picks rather than digging for gold? I absolutely do. I think one of the key things you've got to look at, though, certainly when you talk about a SPAC, is the company has to be large enough and have a total addressable market 
to be a public company, they also have to be ready to be a public company. So that means a very large built out corporate team, not just softwares and developers and strategy. You've got to have the general counsel, the CFO, you've got to have audited accounts. There's, there's so much it takes to be a public company that I do worry that some people are going out or thinking about this as something, oh yes, I can do this now, even though from an infrastructure place, they really need to be, to be ready. Um, we do see a lot of interest in the public markets in AI and autonomy. And I think what's happened is COVID and the, the transition to kind of work from home or the acceleration of technologies, whether it be Amazon or Zoom or the ancillary. So people are significantly more interested. They feel like they lost out on the Teslas or the SpaceXs when they were early. And now they're saying, look, we want some exposure to those emerging, emerging companies that are, go that are going to rapidly transform the landscape through their technological evolution. So I think that's why you see the additional popularity of SPACs and the interest of both institutional investors that are looking for more exposure to these in retail. But I, I do want to point out to everyone, I think this is kind of a misunderstanding. If you look at the predominant investors in SPACs, they are institutional investors that have been long investing in this space and only a small number of retail investors. So when they look at some of these early stage companies, whether it be a quantum scape or an archer or some of the other ones, you know, they understand as they go into this kind of where that is in the spectrum and that there is, there could be an opportunity to lose your money if things don't go well, given where the state of these technologies are. If someone's watching this and they want to go public, it's really a, what, a, six months to a year to get yourself ready with the systems? I think at least, look, it, and it depends on where you were. You know, we had companies that were thinking of going public through a direct listing or something, and they took years to get themselves ready. You've got to have the audited financial statement. You've got to have the controls in place. You've really got to understand what it means to have the, the, the requirements. So that takes some organizational, organ, organizational capability. You've got to have the, the capability of the cash to hire the large team. And then you've got to understand where you are on the on the revenue spectrum. Are you pre-revenue? Are you early? And what are you going to continue to tell the public markets throughout this period until you are in revenue? So it, it's, a, it's a tightrope, and you've got to be prepared and careful as you go through that path. So the title today is, uh, which will go autonomous first, cars, planes, or flying taxi. Um, do you see it as a competition? Because aviation's taken a lot of technology from the auto industry, and I guess vice versa. Absolutely. I do see there to be some convergence, and I, I've long talked about who is going to be the real winners in this VTOL spec spectrum. Is it going to be the auto companies or that know how to manufacture things in large scale, or is it going to be the the OEMs, the aerospace OEMs that know how to get things certified because that is a unique and important skill. And, and we always underestimate production certificates. So I, I do see that being a race as to where VTOLs fall in the spectrum. Is it in the aerospace A&D sector or do we see it in the mobility sector that the automotive companies are looking? If you look at cars, uh, drones, or passenger vehicles, look, I think they're all on their unique path of progression and are also regulated in a different way. I personally, I had thought that autos would be there, but the uh, distributed format in which we approve autos on a state-by-state -state basis and now the trepidation seem to be holding that a bit back, uh, sl making it slower than I would have thought. So I would vote right now that we're going to see it in drones that that is going to be the place where we're going to see autonomy progress at a faster pace. It doesn't mean aerospace and, and passenger vehicles or piloted vehicles are not going to be. But look, the, the, the approach one takes within the FAA, you're not in the BVLOS category, you're in the Part 23, is a different one. And so that will be a bit slower and thoughtful in an appropriate manner. Um, you know, you've been there. You worked at a aircraft OEM. How easy is it to get something certificated? I think we all know it's pretty hard. And in our old world where means of compliance were public, you know, and there is a clear guidelines um, under um, how you comply with the Part 23 certification, it's even more difficult now because, and for good reasons, the FAA was smart 
they are they did not set out a predefined way in which you are going to build and approve these. They're saying we're going to look at the redundancy and the capability of these aircraft and then form a means of compliance jointly together. But that does to some extent make it difficult, especially in the US, because these companies are figuring it out. The companies and the FAA are figuring it out together and that can take a little longer. I think in the end, that'll result in more flexibility and better regulations but in the beginning, there is more of a determination process that the two have to go together. I would say the second part, and I've always looked at this, is the production certificate. If you look at how EASA works, they don't separate the type certificate from the production certificate. They look at them in, in uh, concert, and it's a process done together. In the U.S., we, we separate them, and we do a production certificate. We do a type certificate, and then we certify the production. And, and that in the past has caused even traditional OEMs difficulty. So I do think it is a, as um, a concern to the new OEMs we have in the market that are building aircraft that, yes, there's one way you can get it certified. But then there's a second almost equally difficult process called the production certificate. And we haven't had anyone who's encountered that yet. I know you've got another call coming. So I'm going to be quick. Oh, and, exactly. and the other thing is that when you've got your certificates. It's not always easy to make money producing aircraft, is it? Yes, and, and we know that well. And, and I think um, that's the tough part. If you look at any of these OEMs, there are actually very few that make a significant market, given the huge cost up front of building a clean sheet new aircraft. I, I would encourage people, and I do say this, to look at to look at Tesla as a role model. And I think that is what the markets have started to do. I always point back to their Roadster which was a truly terrible aircraft that they produced in the late, you know, in the, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember, I'm so old now, in, in the 09s. It was awful. And I remember riding in that being like, I can't even fathom this being a great company. But they iterated, they produced, they understood the technology. And to this day, there is still no one out there that meets what Tesla has produced in terms of form, function, safety, never mind battery range. So I think it's, it has kind of changed and adjusted everyone's lens in which they look through these new companies, realizing once again, it's a progression that the first vehicle that you come out with may not be the winning product, but you've got to evolve these technologies and be patient. Okay, I've got a great question and then I'll let you go uh, from Cormac Mackay. Uh, car manufacturers are afraid of shared mobility, um, mobility as a service, eating into sales and the end of car ownership. That won't be an issue for UAM because it will be uh, mobility as a service from the get-go. Do you agree with that? I do predominantly. I think that the, the VTOL OEMs are approaching it that way for safety reasons. And I've always talked about they want to be full stack, kind of, um, you know, duplicating how Silicon Valley approaches it. But you have some people who aren't taking that approach. I mean, if you look at the way beta is approaching the world, they are not planning to have mobility as a service. They are planning to sell their vehicles. So I don't think there is definitively one way, but I think um, he was right in pointing out that it is much more difficult to transform your supply chain and your company from a unit sales to mobility as a service. And it was hard for the software guys to go from client server to SaaS, and it will be equally hard, if not harder, for the, the autom automotive companies if we do take that path. Okay, and a question from Shan McKenna at RVI Group. Do you expect resistant with, resistance with passengers getting on board pilotless aircraft? Look, I, I think people will be cautious, and they should be. What we believe is that we're going to see it occur in the, uh, the package delivery and the freight areas first, just as you kind of see it in the automotive as well, so that that will be the areas in which you have a remotely piloted aircraft in the beginning. And the way the FAA is looking at it is that that remotely piloted aircraft will also be piloted for a period of time to kind of transition into those technologies before they get approved. So absolutely, passengers should wait for this, these technologies to evolve and for wait for them to have, you know, thousands and thousands of hours of experience and for the FAA to, to adequately um, approve these. But I think the important thing is to understand that that, and everyone's always said this, it is easier to fly autonomously in the air than it is on the ground. So we will have the capabilities in time. There are so many different capable companies working at this that it is just a natural progression. It won't be two or three years, but it will happen.
Great. Sorry, final, final question from Mike Francis. Uh, given that First Republic Bank, given the numerous vehicles in development, are investors looking for upside in the technology in each vehicle or the vehicle themselves? I'm wondering if, how, all these vehicles will be commercially successful. I think it's a good question of will they all be commercially successful. So um, I always put out that I remember being in, you know, 1999 and Google was just coming out and thinking they were crazy to challenge Yahoo. So I don't think we should assume that the, the front, the first people out to market are always the winners because there are people who can evolve behind them. Um, I also believe that, you know, we have multiple different airframe manufacturers out there today and, and there could be a large enough market for the range that they approach and, and the market that they approach. So um, I think that's one of the both scary and fun parts about today is a recognition that you can't predict the future in five to 10 years. Brilliant. Kirsten, thank you so much. Great to see you. Good to see you, Al. Thanks. Thank you. And we're now delighted to head to Arm Stoshek, Project Executive, Wayfinder, AQ'd by Airbus. And Arm is perfect because you've worked in automotive at Volkswagen, Audi, and Lucid. And now you're in aviation leading Wayfinder. Do you want to explain a little bit about Wayfinder to people? Thanks, Alastair. So um, I'm uh, with AQ by Airbus. AQ is the innovation center of Airbus in Silicon Valley. And I lead a uh, project Wayfinder. The goal of this project is to develop autonomous flight machine learning solutions to enable the self-piloted aircraft operation. And uh, we are located in Silicon Valley and shouting distance to uh, uh, many uh, autonomous uh, vehicle companies. So you've worked in both industries. That's um, right, yes. Which, which makes you unique. Um, how do they compare in terms of market size, challenges uh, for going autonomous and opportunities? Okay, so yeah, moving from automotive to a different industry, that was about the first question I was asking. So which of, of those learnings from autonomous cars are applicable for the topic of autonomous flight? So the, maybe to start with, with the market, so both in both domains, uh, ground vehicles and air vehicles, autonomy is big business and uh, both are trillion dollar industries the uh, um there is a bit of a difference in what it means for the original business model so the uh, in automotive my observation is that autonomy represents a true uh, shift in business model so it's uh, for most automotive oem it's volume business and the um uh, way how the vehicle is utilized, it's very different automotive than in, in, in aerospace. So, the, so for automotive companies, autonomy uh, pretty much cuts into the uh, profit unless you uh, do a shift in the business model. And that means the existing manufacturers, they must reposition their business assumption to uh, materialize on the uh, promise of autonomy in the aviation industry, uh, it's a slightly different uh, situation. So uh, my understanding is it does not represent a shift in the business model because the uh, um, yeah the aircraft are usually uh, used as an how to say a taxi and an asset with very high utilization. And uh, another uh, aspect is. In terms of uh, progression, the um, uh, modern aircraft, such as Airbus A350, uh, it's uh, they have a lot of the technical components uh, that uh, make the shift from automation to autonomy more of a gradual step, uh, such as uh, in vehicle communication systems, fly by wire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Good. Then uh, looking at the technical challenges between those two, two industries. So in, in aviation, uh, so we have much higher safety expectations than automotive. And uh, there is no fender bender if it comes to an aircraft. And also in aviation, autonomy is a true 3D uh, topic. And then also our vehicle speeds are substantially higher than what you have in ground vehicles. 
And but on the bright side, uh, the uh, in aviation, our vehicles are operated in much more controlled environment than in, in automotive. And there are also several layers of, of traffic deconfliction that uh, make the uh, the problem a little bit more constrained. It's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about the business model angle before. Um, so why is aviation pursuing autonomy? What's the benefit? The, uh, so we believe that um, autonomy can uh, in, uh, address our industry need to uh, uh, scale and a scale in a more sustainable way. And just to put some numbers around it, so uh, we expect, or the, the, the common industry expectation is that the passenger volume grows from 8 uh, billion passengers to, uh, sorry, from eight, 4 billion to 8 billion passengers in about 20 year time frame. And uh, yeah, to put it in perspective, that's about the uh, world population that is to fly every year. And the uh, that represents a big business opportunity, but also uh, a, a challenge uh, such as uh, pilot shortage, et, et, et cetera. And so the question for us is, how can we scale, uh, pretty much double the, the passenger volume uh, under an existing uh, paradigm? And so that makes uh, autonomous flight and, and very interesting, relevant uh, technology. So, uh, do you want to take us through uh, where are you with Project Wayfinder? Where is where are you at the moment with that work? Good. So, uh, autonomous flight uh, development is obviously a very very complex uh, topic. So, with Project Wayfinder, we are uh, focusing on a few uh, topics such as. Um, well, to use some geek term, perception, decision making. Um, so, um, how can you basically create intelligence in an aircraft that allows it to uh, react to unforeseen events? And then also, how do we ensure that those uh, systems are safe? And a big part of that is the uh, uh, number one core algorithm development, and number two. Um, assessing the or, or getting the necessary data to develop those systems, both to basically train uh, algorithms, but also do the validation and verification of those algorithms. And so what we are currently very much focusing on is means to do massive uh, collection of data to uh, allow us to understand how to train algorithms, but also how to ensure the safety of those algorithms. What, what I find amazing is how it came from a really small project, or not small, but you came from the small Vahana, and now you've got it on top of, a, you know, on board large commercial airliners. Um, well, well, to some extent, the uh, underlying technologies are very similar, and uh, also the, the whole aspects of what you uh, need to build is something that is uh, safe and certifiable. Yeah, I know, I know. I just think it's interesting the way it's scaled up. From and you're right, I completely agree with you. Um, it does. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and it's um, when you talk about passenger numbers doubling. Most of these forecasts came before COVID, so this year we've seen uh, the commercial aviation industry hammered by COVID. Do, do we still need? Do we still worry about the pilot shortage? Do we still need autonomy? Well, the. Uh... Yeah, predicting the future is difficult. The uh, uh, it's um, well, it's, so globally speaking, domestic air travel is, is starting to recover, but um, the um, we expect to return to the 2090 uh, air traffic levels between 2023 and 2025, but uh, with single aisle recovering first, and then the international travel probably uh, taking a little bit more. Uh, the uh, the personally, uh, whoever I speak to uh, tells me I want to visit family, I want to go on a business trip, so etc. The so uh, air traffic will recover, and then we are back to the same problem: how do we uh, scale that industry? And so, for the aviation industry, 
So the pandemic that underscores two truths that that we uh, are prioritizing. So one is how to be uh, protect our market share and margins, and and the second, how do we maintain and improve our uh, or the exceptional safety record? And so, the in particular for COVID, I mean safety, so we're going to need even uh, more prominent meeting. The uh, and uh, autonomy is the technology, is one technology that allows us to reduce those operating costs and also improve uh, safety topics. So, when we look at the projects out there that people are working on. Some are going for uh, incrementally towards autonomy. They're saying we'll start with a pilot, we'll have a pilot, and then eventually we'll turn our, our projects into autonomous vehicles. Others are going, we're going to be a 100% um, unmanned from the start, unmanned pilot from the start. Do you think there's a right and wrong answer about what companies should do? Well, the... Uh... I think it depends on the type of vehicle that you build. So if you build an air taxi and you have four seats, um, the utilization of the four seats is, is definitely a different topic of compared if it's in a large aircraft with 400 passengers. The, uh, uh, the uh, entry into the autonomy topic uh, that uh, we are considering is with what's called single pilot operation. So in large commercial aircraft, uh, you would have a pilot on board and uh, autonomy would start as a support system for the pilot, as a backup system. And uh, we will understand uh, what it means for our technical solution, how we operate aircraft and go from there. Okay, we've got a question from one of your colleagues. Well, uh, it, 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 I don't know how you, we, it assists part of Airbus. Jean Robert at uh, head of business development at Airbus Corporate Jets is asking it when, what year will autonomous VTOL take over from manned helicopters? It's a nasty question to get from a you know your your partner. Well, the um, being on the engineering side, um, it, uh, my focus is uh, not necessarily on the product rollout, so but on on the core uh, product. Uh, technology development. So I would really refer to that uh, question to uh, uh, my colleagues and in, in, in more on the product side. Okay, I've got one. Um, I don't it, know if you saw to, uh, to, to stay out, out of the Snapple's answers. I mean, this this topic is not a 50 year or whatever. This is, we, we talked in the uh, in uh, fairly um, narrow time frame to put it Great. that way. I, I, I think, but we also can't give you, no one expects you to give us month and year. Um, we've got a question from Alex Kowalski at Neuron Innovations. Has AQ done any work, again, I think this is outside your specialist area, has AQ done any work on wake turbulent separation standards from manned aircraft? Also visual DAA to speed up the industry with these visual data libraries ever be shared? I understand it's an interesting topic. I'm not aware of activities in uh, the a uh, Innovation Center in Silicon Valley. Okay. Um, Cameron Spencer is asking if you can short SPACs, you can short anything you want. Uh, um, I don't know if you saw the research from Purdue University a few months ago when they were able to train pigs to control joysticks. Do you think that could be an option for the pilot shortage? I hope not. <laughs> to be an, uh, I mean, if I have respect of, of Purdue University, my son studies there, but uh, the pixel loop may not be the way to do it. It's, um, I could be a... more in AI based systems. Uh, as in... <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you. We're now going to go to Dave Merrill. Dave's the co founder of Elroy Air. Um, Elroy Air's leading the uh, advanced uh, freight. VTOL market, cargo, VTOL cargo. Dave, how are you? Doing well, thanks. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we've got lots of questions from you. You're going to basically be the one who has to answer e all the eVTOL um, safety ones. Do you want to take us through what Elroy's doing for people who aren't aware? Sure, yeah, happy to give a quick intro. Um, so we're uh, an aerospace and logistics company. Our mission is to enable same-day shipping to every person on the planet. 
and we're developing autonomous aircraft systems and software to expand the reach of express shipping worldwide. So these are uh, aircraft um, that will provide, ex they're, they're going to expand express middle mile capacity for commercial shippers, um, immediate aid and relief in disaster and firefighting and autonomous aerial resupply for troops in the field. And so the, to get specific about our system, we're building an aircraft uh, called the Chaparral. It is an autonomous vertical takeoff and landing aircraft specialized to deliver cargo by air. And uh, it builds on some of the powertrain and perception technology that's enabling the hybrid electric uh, autonomous vehicle revolution and can operate outside of airport infrastructure. So the basic specs are 300 to 500 pounds of payload and a 300 mile range. And so what this means is airport to warehouse, warehouse to warehouse, warehouse to the parking lot of commercial customers. Um, it, it creates an it creates a, a air cargo network that doesn't require the airport infrastructure and doesn't require the roads. So uh, at Elra Air, we've been working on this problem for four years. We flew a full-scale demonstrator aircraft in the back half of 2019. Um, and we're now building the full envelope, long range capable vehicles now. And, and your product, uh wouldn't work with a pilot, would it? The chaparral. No, it's designed for you know no pilot, no no pilot on board the system. Um, and so we, uh, you know, there, I know there are a few VTOL air taxi companies like Whisk, which is taking the same approach. But for cargo, um, it's a it's a different problem space, um, which I think is actually much easier than piloted or unpiloted air taxi for passengers, because the if you think about the you know kind of parallel paths of a system of this scale for cargo versus a system of this scale for passengers, the kind of missions that a passenger system needs to run, I, I call them the double black diamond safety case, because you have not only people on board the aircraft, the most precious cargo, but in order to build a business for air taxi, it's got to be flying over a densely populated urban metro, you know, to get people across town, to get people from the exurbs into downtown Whereas we've got a system of a similar scale, but nobody's on board. And the kind of routes that we can set up for aiding this middle mile segment of logistics can be much lower risk. Um, you know, they can be in rural places at first expanding that footprint of express logistics out to a lot of spots where big commercial shippers just couldn't do express today. There's a lot of talk about the small um, last mile delivery drones. What's the fundamental differences between what they're doing and your project and not just weight? Yeah, um, well, they're, they are smaller, they're lighter. So in terms of physics, uh, there's just a different amount of kinetic energy involved, which feeds into the safety requirements. Um, but, uh, you know, the, there's some differences in operations and kind of how they'll be constructed too. Um, you know, large UAS like ours are more likely to operate in mixed use airspace with other larger manned aircraft. So, you know, for, for many applications, a small UAS can operate happily in, in near surface airspace that's very unlikely to contain manned aircraft. And so, you know, unmanned traffic management style rules will easily enforce this separation without too much infrastructure. Um, whereas at our scale uh, of system, we're more likely to be up with you know, GA aircraft. And so we're going to need a, a, a kind of more comprehensive airspace integration. Um, and I'd say the other the other main difference is that um, the, the kind of detect and avoid and situational awareness that's going to be required for small UAS is different for larger systems. Um, you know, let me just talk in terms of kind of the capabilities of such systems. So for small delivery drones, for instance, the, the size, the weight, the power constraints on sensors means that they need to use very small components. Shorter sensor range is necessary because, you know, they don't fly very fast, so they don't need as much look ahead. Um, and they're going to need to detect smaller and more complex obstacles like tree branches, power lines, things that are generally, you know, lower than a large UAS flight and not going to be an issue. Um, at, a, at a system of our scale, um, you know, the size, weight, and power is less of a constraint. Um, so we can put bigger sensors like radar on board, uh, you know, that have a longer range, a longer look ahead, which is necessary because the system will be flying faster. And so obstacles like, you know, other aircraft are going to be detected um, 
they're going to be detected further out and they tend to be more predictable. Um, the reliability must be higher in systems of our scale since, uh, you know, the cost of, of a collision would be much higher in terms of safety and monetary impact. We've, um, what's your thoughts on, you've talked about consumer acceptance of getting in a VTOL. Um, what do you think the consumer acceptance is going to be of one flying over your house? Um, I think there's a, yeah, I think it's easier because the behavior change required to get into a VTOL aircraft is, I think, hard to predict how, how much of an obstacle that's going to be. Um, it certainly is behavior change. Like how many, how many people have taken a ride in a helicopter today? Not very many. Um, I think that passenger VTOL is going to be amazing and transformative, but it's a lighter lift to, to do cargo. You know, because we have, like I said, this um, the the mission profile lends itself toward you know safer, lower risk missions from er earlier in the process, and then we don't have the behavior change needed in terms of um, flying. You know, flying over your house. Um, you know, at altitude, all these vehicles are going to be pretty quiet, um, so I don't think it's going to be a big deal. Um, and also for logistics, you you know, you just you do have more options on how to route these systems so that they don't go right over neighborhoods wherever possible. So it's kind of, it's going to be a two pronged approach of, you know, making sure that the aircraft is as quiet as possible, but also choosing routes that avoid impacting communities. And um, do you want to explain what enabling technologies are making this possible for you to do it today? Sure. Yeah. There's three, three key pieces. Um, number one, powertrain. So there's been a ton of progress on electric and hybrid electric powertrain over the past couple decades. You know, we have good power dense brushless motors and motor controllers, better batteries every year, kind of incrementally improving battery technology. And then, you know, coming down the pike really fast are other alternative uh, power plant sources like hydrogen fuel cells. That'll be zero emissions. So they're starting to become ready now. So that, collection of technologies is a piece of it. The other piece that I mentioned is perception. So um, our aircraft is built to be part warehouse robot when it's on the ground. And what that means is we're taking a page from drop freight where the truck is separate from the trailer. And when the trailer is loaded and the truck is ready, they connect and go. And the upshot of that is that um, the, the truck and the driver can stay utilized. They don't wait around for getting loaded and unloaded. So we're doing a similar thing with the Chaparral aircraft where we've designed modular cargo pods that are not part of the aircraft that the aircraft picks up and deposits um, with the goal of maximizing the utilization of the aircraft and uh, creating a safe and flexible operating environment. Um, and so some of the enabling tech for these ground operations are the same perception sensors that autonomous cars are using. So LiDAR allows our system to taxi itself to a cargo pod without bumping into anything, get aligned, pick up the cargo pod. And then up in the air, um, we're looking at options like radar and some other even more interesting options for deconfliction with other, uh, with other aerial systems. Um, you know, and I would say in the air, it's both for automated DAA, but also for um, situational awareness for uh, a remote pilot on the ground. So the question came up earlier, um, you know, remote piloted. Um, we're designing the Chaparral system for autonomy from start to finish, but recognizing that in some operational situations, there will need to be a pilot. And mostly this will come down to, you know, regulatory permissions we believe we'll start needing at least a remote pilot who is the pilot in command. And so giving that remote pilot situational awareness and the ability to talk to ATC is going to be important. Um, so that's the first two powertrain uh, en enabling tech, perception enabling tech, and then the airspace integration, um, which is, you know, partly about the tech, partly about the policy. Um, you know, small UAS are already getting operational for drone deliveries. Um, and then there are companies like AirMap and others that are working to enable a more kind of, you know, automated unmanned traffic management. And so we see that coming up and ultimately being the way that all of these new aircraft integrate into the airspace. But 
as we as we go and as we deploy, we're expecting to start with a little more hands-on um, interaction with the ground pilot. So you're looking at latest developments in ground, in air, um, your colleagues who are trying to do eVTOL with passengers. Which do you think will be first? Mm. What, you mean autonomous vehicles? Which ones yeah. will deploy first? Um, controversial question, I'm sure. Um, I think uh, there are these different different threads that are all pushing in, in parallel. So um, autonomous cars are in trials now. Um, you know, I, I don't know how far along companies like Waymo and Cruise are truly, but I see their cars all over San Francisco every time I go outside. Um, I, I think the hard part about self-driving cars is that it's a very crowded environment with other cars and pedestrians everywhere and a lot of ambiguity. So there's a lot of edge cases that autonomous cars need to be able to handle gracefully um, that, that go beyond the kind of complexity that you'd find in the air in a, you know, the kind of constrained structured environment. So, um, you know, I think that there's a, there's a good basis for delivery drones scaling before autonomous cars on the ground. Um, you know, you've got low risk missions, no passengers on board, low risk routes. And then, um, it, it's just a much more structured environment, uh, in the air. You know, you've got, you've got spacing and separation, um, published, constraints like TFRs, um, centralized control, a ATC. And as we put in the final pieces of detect and avoid um, and the, the interface to the remote, remote pilot, um, there's just a lot less complexity with that amount of structure that's in the air versus the kind of you know chaos that can be on the ground. So I think that aerial systems will actually scale first into broader deployments. Great. That's a, I wasn't expecting a hard answer. Um, you've got loads of questions. One from Sachin Agawal at uh, USPS. How would airspace management differ for El Rey aircraft as compared to last mile delivery drones? You've touched on this, but do you want to go a bit further? Sure. Yeah, I think the main thing is that um, last mile delivery drones, um, my understanding is that they'll be flying low. They'll be, you know, basically part 107 type rules, um, you know, under 400 feet. Um, and so the differences will be that our systems will be up at a higher altitude flying above where the delivery drones are, let's say, you know, 2000 to 10,000 foot, somewhere in that range. Um, and they're going to be more integrated, like I mentioned, into the air traffic, um, you know, with, with ATC and in the early days, likely that, that, uh, voice relay to the, to a pilot on the ground. Um, question from Lucas Wilcox. How is the collaboration going between Elroy and Ombre X, Embraer X, and what does each bring to the party? Sure, yeah, it's good. We have a, what I would call an advisory relationship with Embraer X. Um, basically, they, you know, we've we're both interested. We're developing systems in this space that are non-competing. Uh, they're working on uh, air taxi. We're working on cargo, and so. Um, I think what we bring to them is a, a kind of peek behind the curtain of a fast moving startup and how we get things done on a tight budget with a small team. Uh, and, you know, that's always interesting for a larger company that has, you know, a really amazing process for getting big aircraft done. It's, it's useful. I think, um, you know, can't totally speak for them, but I think it is useful to have, uh, to get to see how, uh, how a leading startup works on a similar problem. And then for us, um, we get access to experts uh, in an advisory capacity. So we can talk to some of the world experts uh, about matters like certification, uh, production, you know, looking at some of their sales network and sharing leads on who might want to use our system. Um, so there's a there's a it's a lightweight agreement, but it does give us um, good kind of good resources. Great. We've got a question from uh, Steve Vasano at the Jet Business. Do you plan to operate these vehicles as a turnkey operating system or sell them to companies who operate them like existing localized trucking companies? The answer is yes. Um, we are gearing up to be able to do both. 
Um, and the reason we're doing that is because we have customers in each group. So some customers uh, who typically are the ones that already operate aircraft, fleets of aircraft, um, they're interested to buy and operate our systems. And so for those customers, we'll, be, we'll play the role of the OEM, sell aircraft, you know, provide them training and support ongoing. Um, other customers who don't have, uh, either don't have uh, aviation experience or, you know, don't want the assets on their balance sheet, variety of reasons, want us to come in and provide air cargo as a service. And so in those cases, we're happy to do that. You know, we'll be building out our operational team anyway uh, to get systems tested, to get them into pilot programs. And so we're gearing up to be able to do both. Both, both types of business. Brilliant. Dave, thank you so much. We've got loads of questions, so I'll probably come back to you if that's okay. But thank you very much. Uh, sure I'm now going to go to someone who's completely neutral, Patrick McGee, San Francisco correspondent at the Financial Times. Patrick, are you on holiday this week? I am on holiday this week. And I can't believe you're doing this. This is crazy. Uh, well, I feel guilty. I'm like I'm on a beach in Hawaii, so you're really not disturbing anything. Um. I've got terrible sound going through a moment. Um, can you hear me okay? I can hear you really fine. Is that not working? It's not working brilliantly, no. Um, yeah, let me that. Yeah, don't try that. It's a bit better, yeah. I know you're having a tech nightmare today. Um, I've lost you completely now. Um, we can go back to the headphones. Go back to... Okay, is that better? I've, lo um, I've lost you completely now. It's such a, we find that the more techy you are, the less reliable air meters. Okay, different headphones, AirPods now. I've still not got you. If you try the button at the bottom, the three dot one, we might be change your audio and visual. I've still not. Okay, sorry about this, Patrick. I can't believe I feel particularly bad because Patrick's on holiday. That he's having to have the hassles of air meat. Um, okay. No, still haven't got you. Um, and you're not muted. Hi, can you? I'm talk. I still haven't got you. Okay, I'll tell you what, Patrick, I'll go back to Dave for a second and see if we can get, if Dave's still there. Dave, thank you. We've got lots of questions. Um, uh, nice question from, uh, great question from Mark Kelly, uh, experience experienced Ragecraft uh, operator and financier, MK Consulting. Will uh, products you be used for firefighting, agri, forestry applications? Uh, I hope so. Uh, I know that the government is interested in those use cases. Um, you know, we're designing the Chaparral platform to be a general point-to-point -point VTOL logistics system for 300 to 500 pounds of cargo. And um, I've seen some interest over the past couple of years from the Department of the Interior asking for proposals and information about systems that could carry resupply to firefighters. So... Um, it, I think it'd be a great use case for our system. We're primarily focused on the commercial logistics market. And so designing the range and payload and capabilities for that middle mile logistics market. But um, I think, uh, you know, I'd love for Chaparral's to be delivering uh, resupply for firefighters too. I think that's a great use case. Patrick, can you talk now? All right, this is just my computer, nothing fancy. Perfect. Okay, okay. Dave, right. we'll come back to you if that's right. Patrick, thanks so much. I'm, this is just ruining your holiday. I'm feeling even more guilty. Sorry, Alfie. I'm um, so Hi. sorry. Uh, okay, so you're neutral. You're the one person on the call who doesn't have a, a bias towards aviation. <laughs> where are you most excited about autonomy, and where do you think it will happen first, on the land or in the air? So I think the, the cute answer, and I hate to be a politician here, is that it already has happened 
uh, in on the road, right? I mean, you do have an autonomous service in Phoenix by Waymo, and you have an increasing number of permits allowing uh, companies like Cruise or like Neuro to remove the driver um, from the equation altogether. You see that both in California, Nevada, and California. Um, the question, of course, is when will it actually be meaningful? And I don't think anyone living in Phoenix thinks that the Waymo service is revolutionary and has changed their life in any way. I don't think you'd sort of, you know, purchase a house just based on that sort of idea. And of course, that's meaningful because the whole idea of a driverless vehicle is that it would be a sort of like landscape changing technology. And I don't, I think we're so far away from that. And the scaling is such a difficult problem. So, the, you know, the next 10 years for autonomy in on the road, I think is very much a technological question. You really do need to solve 99.99999% of corner cases. Otherwise, you know, you deploy 10,000 of these vehicles and you know, sorry to be too blunt, but dead bodies are going to stack up pretty quickly. And people like me in the media are going to make it front page news. And uh, it's just going to go south real fast. Um, so I, I think it's a technology question. And then uh, in addition to that, you, of course, have to um, also make it commercially viable. And, and I highly doubt that Waymo is making money in Phoenix right now. I don't know how long a, a way that is in terms of driving down the cost of the technology, making it commercially viable. Then, of course, and then, frankly, even when that happens, then you have a problem where if six different companies do this, you have a race to the bottom. So, you know, the future for autonomy on the road, I can be quite cynical about, I must say. In the air, I'm much more optimistic, but I think the problem is less about technology. I think, you know, unmanned drones have already uh, demonstrated techno technology. Um, it's more of a public optics. You know, I don't know how many people want to witness the San Francisco uh, skyline and, and picture another, you know, or sorry, 400 vehicles, you know, flying around, um, just causing all kinds of chaos. I'm aware that the future does not look like the fifth element or the back to the, back to the future style idea where, you know, I think David mentioned air map. You're going to have this sort of orchestrated, you know, invisible highway type scenario. But I think from the ground for the layperson, it still may look like utter chaos. And I don't know how willing regulators are going to be to um, have that have that system sort of in every city, uh, you know, across America or eventually across the world. That strikes me as just it's so. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure just everyone, even in the business, just finds it implausible to picture that reality. I, I get that we could be there, but you know, I have a two year old, and if you look at the skyline uh, or sorry, the projections of of Joby, uh, you know, they think that this will begin happening in three years, and I imagine that means scaling in five or six years, and I just think. You know, is my daughter, when she's eight years old, really going to be sort of flying from a skyscraper in Manhattan to the airport in 10 minutes? And this is just all part of our normal reality. I hope it happens. Don't get me wrong. But it's just such a change to our modes of transportation that I find it difficult happening on anything like the scales uh, and projections that they're coming out with as they spec. And do you, um, <laughs> is that a surprise to you that you write about SPACs all the time? Sorry, it's which part of the surprise? Well, I mean, you know, if you're doing a SPAC, the whole point of a SPAC to some extent is that you don't have to look back the next, the last five years, you can look forward the, the next five years. And so, of course, to some extent, it often looks like the numbers are just coming out of nowhere with projections that don't have to be fully vetted. And so you have a lot of companies with zero revenue today, zero revenue projected next year, and then all of a sudden we're in the billions. And there's just a lot of assumptions baked in and reporting on this the next couple of years is just going to be fascinating. I mean, you know, one little anecdote, I used to be our German correspondent. And I feel like even in the, you know, 2015 to 2020 period, the Germans were still coming to grips with the idea of venture capital backed companies that were not making a profit Tesla sort of key among them, because the Germans are so auto focused, and nevertheless, just scaling the world. And, you know, coming out with these business models that basically just put revenue uh, and profits way into the future. Well, now, especially with the SPAC era, we're going to uh, a point where it's not even revenues are being, or sorry, sorry, it's not even that profits are being deferred. It's revenues are being deferred. So, I mean, reporters like me are going to be reporting on companies, dozens, hundreds of companies in the next few years that have no uh, profit, that have no revenue, and that don't even have revenue and, pipe, revenue and profit in the short-term pipeline. And that's just going to be such a bizarre experience. We, we, we've gone some. We've gone from companies like WeWork that you know have a model and then try to sort of you know what's it called blitz scale uh, the world and worry about how they actually figure out the, the profits later to basically just a bunch of private R and D projects that are now public. Um, that's pretty bizarre, and I don't know that there's much precedent for it. So it's going to be fascinating. Um, so obviously, some companies will come out of this, you know, shining. Uh, but gosh knows how many how, how how many are going to to fail. There's an article in your paper two weeks ago showing that 96% of all 
IPOs last year were loss making on the New York Stock Exchange, loss making companies, which is just and that yeah. that's probably getting higher, right? I mean, that was last year. This year will be ninety nine. Exactly, but yeah, loss making implies that there, there's at least. Uh, you know, some, some, some revenue being generated there and that they're just not at the profit level. Whereas now I think we're moving to, we don't even have revenue coming in. I mean, that's a crazy change. So what are your thoughts on JB when you were writing up the story last week? So I've, honestly, the difficult thing about some of these companies is that in partly because of COVID and partly because where they are in, in, in technology, journalists like me have not been able to go out, look at the product, experience the product, etc. So, you know, it's not like when Tesla came out with the Roadster or the Model 12, where journalists were literally allowed to ride in the vehicle, and you would understand immediately, wow, the torque of this vehicle is incredible. The acceleration is incredible. You know, there's lots of details. This is a minimalist car. You know, this is amazing. We're just looking, you know, talking to founders over Zoom calls. And so it's a little difficult for me to have real expertise on the technology because we don't even have that nice anecdote of you know look there's some unanswered questions about the scale but i've experienced the prototype and you know I'll, i'm happy to tell you you know patrick mcgee reporting from palo alto or whatever that this is great it's not like that so i'm just looking at powerpoint presentations as anyone else is and i'm just trying to picture is this actually going to happen on the timeline that they imagine and i find it hard to believe that they'll meet it i don't know that that's meaningful however if you've raised enough money in a SPAC with a three-year timeline and you hit it in five years, you're probably just fine. Yeah, and I think, to be fair, JB's extremely credible, been working for a long time. You know, they didn't jump on the bandwagon. They, you know, they were there before the, the horses were attached. Um, so, totally agree. But anyone who's covered the autonomous vehicle industry is completely jaded by three-year timelines because... I would have said the same thing about the Google team that became Waymo, right? They basically founded the whole modern self-driving movement in 2009. Lots of experience. They already had a prototype that you could drive around in. And they had, you know, someone like John Kraftchik come in from Hyundai and say, you know, look, we've got a working prototype. Now we're going to scale. We'll be at tens of thousands of units in a few years. Basically, everybody thought it was plausible. Hasn't happened at all. That's an interesting point because you've been through the cycle of the, you know, the Gartner hype cycle of automotive. Right. Is it good for an industry to go through it? Should aviation be embracing this? Um, sure. I mean, yeah. How else is it going to happen? <laughs> you know, I mean, sure. like, I, I, I think just as a journalist, you don't want to be sucked into the hype cycle and sort of believe every date projection and billion dollar revenue figure that you have. But that's not to say that I'm against the whole idea. I mean, you know, I don't know if Amazon could be what it what it is now without the 90s dot com bubble. Um, but back in 1998, I don't know that I could have predicted it was Amazon.com and not Pets.com that was going to make it through. So it's just very difficult to see who's going to be the winners. But I don't know that the, uh, the sort of trials and tribulations itself is anything to be against. OK, that's great. Um, I'm just having a quick look at questions. Very quick one from Matthew uh, at Petrodynamics. Do investors perceive that all winged VTOL designs are basically the same? JB Archer, Bell, uh, Beta, Lilium? Elroy, Wingcopter, etc. Or do they believe that some designers have material competitive advantages over each other? Is that for anyone or for me? You. I think that goes back to my original question or my original sort of observation that we haven't been able to be in them themselves. So at the moment, yeah, I think it's probably there's a sense of these are all doing the same things. Um, obviously, they have different teams. They have very different designs. I mean, to some extent, you know, there's like a in, in the autonomous grounded world, you know, people criticize the the, the, the the market leaders as sort of having a bread loaf type design. I don't know if you've seen the, the cruise origin or the, the Zooks vehicle, but, you know, it's a sort of symmetrical looking vehicle that can go backwards and forwards without it really being a sense of actually being in reverse, you know, sort of like a train in that sense. Um, you know, so there's sort of a commoditized aspect there. I, I don't think you're seeing that at all. Uh, you know, there's no sort of like standard number of propellers or <laughs> engines or anything with, with eVTOLs. But the number of people who actually sort of know the nitty gritty details here and there and have tried each one, I think is probably numbered in the zero, <laughs> if not, <laughs> if maybe in the dozen. Uh, Dave, did you want to comment on that? Oh, sure. Yeah. And I, I've got to hop off to another call. So this will yeah. have to be my last comment. Um, I think there are, uh, you know, in the in the, both the passenger tall and in the like what we're doing with the chaparral you do see a convergence toward um, a lift plus cruise type design where you've got wing-based flight for cruise and then you've got you know some number of vertical rotors for the vertical takeoff and landing so there is some kind of convergence around that theme where i see the interesting differences are in like 
the amount of extra complexity that different companies are willing to accept in the in the name of efficiency. So for instance, if you take a look at our design versus Joby, the Joby design has rotating motor pods that start out pointing up and then they rotate forward for flight and then back to up. Um, we took a look at doing that kind of thing and decided, well, of course it can be done. You know, the V22 Osprey exists, it works, it did it, but it did take longer to get that aircraft to prime time. And so our approach is to, to kind of knock out complexity adders in our design and try to try to develop the simplest design that can do the job. And so that's why we've got a true kind of lift plus cruise with dedicated vertical rotors and dedicated forward propulsion rather than trying to make a more, um, you know, more interesting, but uh, more moving parts, complicated design. Brilliant. Thanks, David. I'll let you, thanks so All much for right. joining us. All Patrick, right. final question to you. Yeah. What year will your daughter be flying around <laughs> in autonomous aircraft? <laughs> That's funny. So this is actually a question that I asked on the ground autonomy side of things for, for, for John Kraftrick of Waymo. But I basically sort of gave him a, an easy question and I said, will she ever need a driver's license? Right. So I'm giving him what a 14 year window, which is quite a long time. And, and so, of course, he said, you know, there's no question that she'll be able to show up sort of at any airport and there'll be a Waymo waiting for her. Uh, to take her somewhere. So, uh, you know, even that I think is questionable, but but giving someone 14 years in a technology that's been going on since 2009, I think it's quite nice. Um, yeah, I don't know. Other than I would say, I, I, I'd be pretty bearish on the idea that it's three years from now. I'm, I've asked the founders of both Joby and uh, what's the other one, Archer? Archer. Uh, you know, is it the case that in three years, you know, either I show up at SFO or I show up at LAX and I need to get 100 miles somewhere. Um, and basically I'm just f flying there in your, you know, taxi fare, uh, priced uh, flying vehicle, and of course they confidently say confidently say yes. Um, I highly doubt that three years from now either either airport is is hosting such vehicles. But you know, I'm look. I, I don't think the argument is bad that helicopters already exist. Um, you know, they are starting this in a sort of staggered way where autonomy isn't going to be part of the equation just yet. There will be a pilot, and so insofar as they already have existing prototypes and it's just a matter of scaling them and you know they these two companies do have the help of fca uh, on the one hand and um who's the other toyota on the other right so you've got great manufacturing expertise um there's no real reason why this couldn't happen and then because of venture capital they don't really have to worry about it being profitable quite yet right it's a matter of finding a subscription model you know uh creating some sort of network effect getting their record out there etc so I, I could see five six years being plausible and I would love to be surprised. And maybe it is only for you. Brilliant. Patrick, thank you so much. Please come and enjoy your holiday. Thank you. Uh, Dave, thanks very much for joining us. Kirsten and Arne, thank you very much. We had some fantastic questions. We'll come back to them in future town halls. Uh, please remember, it's available on all, favorite, all your favorite podcast channels. And thank you so much to our guests. Thank you. Cheers.